Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Frank Hoffman from the United States National Defense University. Um, you'll have seen his brief biography on the um, invitation, so I won't uh, repeat it, but Frank's had some considerable influence uh, on defense thinking, particularly as an early advocate of the concept of hybrid warfare, and also for some important input into the recently uh, issued US national defense strategy. But Frank um, works and thinks on a wide var variety of other military topics. And as is, he, as is in London, um, he very kindly agreed my offer to come and um, share his thoughts with us. Frank will speak in a moment for about half an hour. He's got some PowerPoint slides. And I'm pleased to say... A Pentagon addiction. Um, they're certainly US-style PowerPoint slides. Um, and I'm pleased to say that he's agreed that the whole event, both his talk, his slides, and um, the Q&A after he's finished speaking, is on the record. Frank, over to you. Thank you. It's going to be the record. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, very honored to be here. I'm amazed that so many people showed up. Uh, my mother's always amazed that anybody wants to hear anything I have to say. I mean, the woman that puts you in, into and out of nappies is always amazed that there's anything I... I have to offer that anybody would find interesting. Um, uh, today's uh, presentation is uh, basically a thought experiment. I'm not uh, selling anything. Uh, I'm not even very knowledgeable about the technologies involved in artificial intelligence. It's just something that has fascinated me. Um, I'm actually an anti-technology kind of proponent. My work in the, inside the Marine Corps had always emphasized the human dimension. Uh, my most significant advancements uh, work in the last few years has focused on uh, the human aspects of conflict uh, more than the, the technology side. But as I've spent several years and been prodded by uh, my policy masters at the Pentagon, both Mr. Work and Mr. Mattis, who I've worked for uh, directly for the last few years, this particular area, uh, the potential for an age of autonomy, I think offers the greatest questions uh, that we need to take a look at. A disclaimer, uh, I am legally and technically on holiday. I'm here speaking entirely for myself. Uh, my boss refused my travel, so I'm unauthorized to even be here. Uh, but if anything I do say is objectionable and you want to write about it, uh, you're, you're certainly free, uh, free to do so. Um, I'd also like to say something. I'm, I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm actually trying to learn something and explore something. I tell you, I'm not a tech person, but I do spend most of my time for the last 20 years thinking about the future whether it's been homeland security, changing character of war, the potential of uh, several different kinds of technology. I think there's a lot of value in thinking hard about the future. My dear friend, Sir Lawrence, is something of a pessimist when thinking about the future because we have so often failed at uh, that. Uh, we failed to understand our foreign cultures and our potential adversaries. We failed to understand uh, the range and the potential of, of technologies. And I think we're often surprised that we often get it wrong. But that doesn't exclude us from trying. And for those of us at the defense policy level, at the enterprise level, it's actually part of our business, uh, not worrying just about yesterday's fight or today's fight, but tomorrow's fight. So I use the phrase uh, healthy skepticism uh, because uh, Sir Lawrence was a little bit skeptical. And for me, being a healthy skeptic is looking for proof, investigating potentials, understanding the potential context and, and the possibilities and the threats of new technologies. And I think we need to be healthy skeptics in the future, particularly with AI. I could spend an entire presentation today talking about many aspects of the changing character of war. Do we need to be prepared to fight directly in conventional terms or indirectly uh, against opponents? You know, we're going to fight uh, major powers in, in direct confrontation, or are we going to deal with their proxies and their surrogates or their auxiliaries? Is warfare converging into the middle of the conflict spectrum, which 15 years ago was the thesis that General Mattis and I had? Nobody would take on the United States in high-end warfare. They'd have to do something else. And the terrorists and the low-end irregulars and militias of the world would have access to, through globalization to high-tech, and the lethality of combat would, would meet us in the middle. We called that convergence. Uh, the last four or five years, everybody's been talking about entire the low-end, whether it's your version of hybrid warfare, uh, political warfare, or competition short of armed conflict, and the high-end, where we spend a lot of time investing, as does Russia, as does China. We could talk about that. We could talk about changes in offense and defense dominance and what hypervelocity quantum computing and AI brings in different domains to where we should invest in defense or in offense. We could talk about the changes in mass maneuver 
The last uh, couple decades has been all about precision and strike in that particular revolution. Uh, but perhaps uh, additive manufacturing, cheap drones, and artificial intelligence is going to bring back maneuver and mass to the battlefield in a way we've not seen in a long time. We could talk about physical and non-physical means, kinetics and non-kinetic tools. We could talk about the desired effects of targets. Are we trying to destroy things? Are we trying to impact and have effects on the cognitive processes of governments, populations, or combatant commanders? And we could talk about attacks against the homeland, counter value, or defeating forces in the field of our opponents, the away game. But today I want to talk about the tension between the old way of fighting fully manned and the potentially terrifying option uh, that is often overhyped, but I think intellectually undeveloped, the nature of autonomy in the future and the range in between, between automated, augmented, and the far out autonomous. Powerful opportunities and perhaps dreadful consequences unless we consider them. The outline of my presentation today, talk a little bit about trends in technology. I'm going to be very loose on that, A, because I'm unqualified, and B, there's probably more qualified people in the room, but just to make sure everybody's on equal ground about what I think is going on. Uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in the UK, United States, in terms of how we're thinking about the future in the security world. Talk more about what's going on with China and Russia, and some response from the United States on our defense strategy. Explore what is a military revolution. I'm going to skip the impact on theory because I don't think everybody in this room or anybody in this room is really interested in Clausewitz to the degree I am, uh, but I teach at a university, and if I don't have a Clausewitz brief and a slide and presentation, at one dead Prussian, uh, it doesn't go over well as meeting the academic test. Uh, but, but this is not an academic audience, and you're all smarter than that, so you're not students, so I won't, I won't do that. I'm very interested in what the implications would be in the out end. We'll go over that. So again, just very briefly on the science side, today we have a degree of narrow artificial intelligence, very task specific. It can do routinized things. We've had 10 or 20 years uh, developing this uh, kind of technology. It's present in some of our defensive systems today, whether it's Aegis or PAC-3, uh, the driving of cars, uh, that kind of technology exists today. We're just starting to mature and understand what that can do, but it's, it's present. Uh, that's the level we're at. When you want to get out to Space Odyssey, you know, 2025 or 2035, you're going to need general artificial intelligence, a much more powerful form of intelligence that's equivalent to a human in reasoning, in thinking, and in creating. And we're still quite a bit away from that. Although, just in the last few years, the development of neural networks, reinforcement learning, deep learning, and machine learning capabilities is kind of accelerating that. So those of us who used to be 2040, 2045 kind of uh, projections for artificial intelligence are now thinking that well, beyond 2025 something might be possible, more likely by 2035 at the current rate of uh, progress on the science side of things. So since I'm uh, late in my years and don't have much uh, service life left, uh, you know, and for General Barry and I, uh, this is probably not going to be realized in, uh, in a, certainly in our professional careers and maybe not in our lifetimes, but for the younger people in the room, this will be the world that you live in. So I don't think I have to go over the robotics and unmanned systems. We have a lot of advances going on in artificial intelligence. Some of it's in intelligence and thinking and reasoning and processing. Uh, there's a lot going on in creative art. Uh, we now have computers that can develop poetry. That's not too bad. Even I might uh, read it. Uh, music. Uh, there's a professor who once claimed that a uh, computer could not develop a symphony and certainly couldn't develop a symphony better than what he could write. He was proven wrong. Uh, it's still not great music, but it's still original music. Uh, we have gone past the chess business. We've gone into Go. Uh, now we're getting into even more advanced games. Uh, poker is a very interesting uh, example of a uh, computer-based multiplayer game in which human factors such as bluffing and human deception uh, are part of the game, and the computers have learned how to play poker and can play well and can actually make a buck. They can make a, they can make a few pounds on the table. Uh, that's where we're getting out of that. But I think the Go examples are the most uh, stimulating ones, and we'll discuss those in a little more detail. The other one I really like for people who don't appreciate the complexity of chess and Go as a cognitive contest, uh, this is a little more real for the military uh, folks in the room. There are simulators today in which an AI-enabled pilot inside a computer simulation flies against this gentleman. This is a retired Air Force officer with 3,000 hours of flying experience. He can't beat the machine that he's flying in that simulation against. So even if 
you don't appreciate the go and stuff, I think that's an indication of we can create training environments where we might face an opponent who has this level of artificial intelligence in the planes, manned or unmanned, that are against us, that would be a step increase in what we can produce. Being a human guy, I like the training value of this for my submarine commanders, for my pilots, maybe for some of my ground commanders, decision makers. You know, if we can create that kind of environment, just in the training perspective, uh, you could have a step change in, in the effectiveness of your force. A lot of value in that already. If you're not familiar with uh, the AlphaGo and the Alpha Zero, AlphaGo uh, played the, the Go Master Sedell in 2016, and AlphaGo was able to beat the, uh, the Chess Master, uh, I think six games in a row. Um, AlphaGo Zero is a new form of computer with the neural networks and the reinforcement learning. AlphaGo Zero was a computer that had never played Go before and only had the rule set for how Go was played inside the, the program. Unlike some of the previous models where we had computers, maybe as big as this room, that knew every single master play that had ever occurred in the last 200 years of chess, and the machine was so fast it could crunch through every example and play against somebody, uh, and know every move and what every potential probability was to win uh, just, by, just by mass cr crunching. This is a much more complicated machine. It, it doesn't use past history. It just takes the rule set and starts playing with itself, and it develops its own winning strategies, its own idea of what would be the most success. And so it just very, very fast learns. It's capable of learning something all by itself. And in this case, AlphaGo Zero in a very short period of time uh, beat the previous machine, uh, the AlphaGo, and then over a period of a couple weeks played it 100 times, and the AlphaGo Zero won, won 100 to nothing. So we're seeing tremendous growth and differential in the machines. You show this in a little bit of time uh, from this David Silver. Silver did a very good article on this. It took 36 hours for a machine that had never played Go, had never seen a Go game, uh, in 36 hours to advance past the previous Go machine, which had access to 100,000 games or 1,000 years of Go history. Uh, in a period of time, then it exceeded uh, human history. And the scale on the left is a rating of Go players. And if you get above 5,000, you must be some kind of a uh, there are no humans at above 5,000. In fact, I don't think there's any humans above 4,000. Uh, but it just took a few days for the machine to beat uh, the level of Sadal and to beat the other machines over a period of time. Uh, it took 40 days. It's the best player in the world. If you can do that in piloting an aircraft, commanding a submarine, or some other kind of weapon or other decision-making process, you're giving a lot of value very quickly to new contexts, to new strategies uh, in a military context. A lot of opportunity there, a lot of threats if you're second, third, fourth, or fifth best in the development of this capability. So it builds a question. My boss, Mr. Work, uh, was pushing these kinds of questions a few years ago, and I resisted studying or learning or thinking about what he was thinking about. But uh, this is a, a paper he and the late Sean Brimley, a dear friend of mine who's now gone. Um, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves these questions. Are we preparing for the right future, either on our off offense or on our, our defense? And in the United States, we've come to the conclusion that we are not, and we're certainly not doing it fast enough, so that Mr. Work and Sean was right. We now recognize this in our future threat assessment from the joint operating environment that the United States has produced, the notion that in two decades, and this is written a year or two ago, so by 2037, 2036, we're going to see significant advances in autonomy, powerful robotic systems, making autonomous decisions and delivering lethal force. That's what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was willing to sign as a projection for the future. Around the same time, in the GST, the fifth edition, which goes all the way out to 2045, which I find to be very, very hard to do. I'm going to stop cutting off all my forecasting about 2035. A, because I'll be dead and it doesn't matter. But B, it's just really hard with all the options out there, with all the technological combinations possible to, to think that far ahead. Uh, but your folks have done it up in Shrivenham. The increased capability of robots likely to change the face of warfare. And that's what, just on the robotic side. And the notion that the possibility, a possibility that some countries may replace large numbers of troops um, with robots by 2045. And the only way to do that is largely through artificial intelligence blended with. Uh, your government has gone a little bit further in the latest issue of the GST, which is a 
world-class, best-of-breed forecasting, both process and document. Uh, I love the explicit nature of the probability judgments that I've highlighted in purple on this particular judgment. Machines capable of combat are likely to be used. Confidence in machines is probably going to grow, and they could be employed further away from human su uh, supervision. It's a soft could be. That's more likely. In time, machines will be used first before we put people in harm's way, so we'll send robots and drones in the first wave, which will learn a lot about a context and an enemy defensive system and cross-learn. That's most likely. Cheap mass-produced swarming devices could be used to conduct attacks. I would take a stronger judgment based on my understanding just the last few years that's likely to be used to conduct attacks early against defensive systems. Our machines are also likely to be developed that automatically engage targets without human intervention. I'm a little softer on that for a variety of legal, moral, and institutional cultural reasons, but it's probably more likely to be, could be developed. Uh, removing the operator from danger, to me, should but will reduce the occurrence of human failings, but I also think it will introduce other automated computer uh, failings as well. So it's, uh, it's positive and negative. Uh, these kinds of projections have generated changes in the United States uh, since 2017 uh, in the National Security Strategy, which I had to participate with General McMaster's staff, and in the National Defense Strategy, where I got to work on the task force that produced that document for Mr. Mattis. Our national security strategy suggests that there's a lot of potential opportunity in a range of technologies, what I call the brine technologies, bio, robotics, information and the cognitive sciences, nano and material sciences and energy. Uh, there are very specific technologies here that are listed. It's the White House's opinion that the field of artificial intelligence in particular is progressing rapidly and needs to be explored and invested in. And since uh, 2015, uh, there's been at least a 50 percent increase in the amount of open source um, AI investments inside the United States government. And that doesn't count the black number, and I have no idea what that number is. Uh, but this is significant. And just in the last year, Mr. Shanahan, after exploring this, has doubled the uh, open source investment in AI in the Pentagon's budget just from 2018 to, to from 2019 to the 2020 budget, which I think was like from 1.5 billion to 3 billion dollars. Uh, so we recognize that need. In the defense strategy, we also recognize that this is the open source unclassified aspect of the Pentagon's strategy, what we're going to buy and what priority. Uh, when this was being developed, it wasn't until the end game that the whole notion of autonomy had to be injected. Mr. Mattis said, where are we addressing this? What prioritization have we given it? And what is the basis for that prioritization? And at the time, we hadn't given sufficient thought, forced us to research this, and ended up being priority number seven, uh, mostly because I was using a, a budget line prioritization. We're putting the most money into nuclear space and ISR and then somewhat in this order. Um, but we injected this. this. This didn't drive the previous budget, 2017 or 2018, but this prioritization list is driving America's thinking about what it wants to invest in the future. I bet in the future, if you were to do the defense strategy in 2020 or 2021, that that prioritization list would change and you'd see it pushed up higher. I had senior defense officials visit me uh, late in the game who wanted to see it as number two, because there was more juice there than we appreciated. Uh, the payoff would be much higher if we make it. And I left it there because that's where the money is right now. It's a much lower prioritization than other things in terms of what we were asking the Congress to fund. So using my logic, it, it stayed at number seven. Uh, I'd also just say that artificial intelligence rather than advanced systems is something that affects each one of these. Uh, our space, our nuclear stability, our command and control capabilities, even logistics, everything's going to be influenced by artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence it's not just synonymous with autonomy and be plugged in there. You could, could see it as a, as a vertical um, element across the entire budget. To advance this kind of thinking, because we believe we're behind, uh, the Pentagon's created a joint AI center inside the Pentagon, put a three-star general in there, uh, given him some money and authority to help set priorities for the department and reduce the inefficiency of services and the research arms doing their own thing. Uh, to try to better integrate that so we don't waste time and particularly don't waste money. So we're not going to put a lot of money against this early as we develop our understanding, but, uh, but we do need to do more. Uh, there are some folks in the country who don't believe that even the Pentagon and the rest of the nation is up to speed on what this 
what this really means for our future in terms of our economic prosperity, in terms of our physical security at home, and potentially military security uses overseas. And so there's a national security AI commission that has been established. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, is the chair of that commission. He's got legislative members, academics, uh, scientists, and Mr. Work on that commission as members. And they're hopefully going to propel our understanding, our understanding of the risks and the consequences of artificial intelligence to the future in a way that gives it some legitimacy and I think some, some public credibility for a, a debate and give that to our Congress and to, and to the White House. Uh, but I think most of the people, when I gave evidence to that uh, commission earlier this year, um, I think it's a balanced uh, commission, but I think they're, they're going to help our understanding quite a bit to include ethics and legal issues as well, which is why it's good to have some legislature uh, members on that. We'll talk a little bit about the, the competition, uh, how other people are looking at this. This is a famous quote from Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin thinks that this is important. Uh, whoever has this is going to run the world. That's a little bit, a little bit harsh or a little bit uh, perhaps part of the hype uh, behind this, uh, but that's where he's at. General Garismov is a, a little bit further behind, but not by much. Uh, he believes that uh, the area of artificial intelligence is going to be uh, used. Uh, we're going to start with some machines uh, over time, uh, but he believes that it's possible to have fully roboticized units and capabilities uh, and, and expects to see an increasing amount of automation and artificial intelligence in that. Uh, they have set as a goal, even though they don't have a national plan or a military plan that we've seen, they have set a goal of capability about having 30% of their maneuver force capability be unmanned. So whether it's in the air in terms of drones or it's uh, unmanned ground systems or unmanned underwater systems, they see some value in that and have set up a, a plan. I haven't seen funding increases. I haven't seen a lot of articles in the literature from them, uh, and I spent a lot of time trying to search for that, but uh, I haven't seen very much. I do know, however, it's open source, that so they've actually taken some capabilities and deployed them to Syria and used them in actual combat conditions. So unlike in the United States where we have actually have some systems and we've tested them or demonstrated them, but never in a war game or never in an experiment where somebody was trying to jam, defeat, or down the, the aircraft, uh, the Russians have actually taken, you know, less than fully mature capabilities and, and have them combat tested. And the results weren't very good. Uh, they, they, as I'm told, they weren't not very successful. Uh, so the good news is they're not very good today. The bad news is they actually have combat tested capabilities. Uh, so they're a step ahead of us maybe in that sense. So they're learning. China's also learning. Uh, they, unlike, uh, would have expected no, morally from the Russians to have a five-year plan. Uh, China actually has a five-year plan. Uh, they've beaten the Russians in that case. They think there's a lot of power in artificial intelligence. So they have a national plan. They've made it a national priority to be a leader in the field. Some of that's for economic prosperity, but some of that's also for their defense establishment. The defense establishment's been well funded. Um, so in this respect, they're ahead of us, a plan and cash and a goal. And I think Mr. Uh, Schmidt's goal with his commission is to see what are the merits of that pace, that investment level, and in what direction we should be going. There are writers, again, I, I read the, the foreign literature. This is a, I believe, a, a reasonably senior academic who's a peer of mine at the, their NDU, and we meet regularly. Um, and have some discussions. Uh, they're exploring, they're going past the informationalized warfare and into algorithmic competition, and they believe that this will be a leg up for them uh, and a faster OODA loop. So they're thinking about it in tactical and operational sense, in making commanders have more information than an American or a Western or an Asian power, and having their theater commanders, their operational commanders, and their tactical commanders think and decide and act faster. So part of my current research is trying to find out some way of measuring and monitoring the competition and finding out if we're behind or ahead. Uh, so I have some aspects of the competition here. On the far left is a, a slide that shows deep learning publications, Chinese, US, Germany, and France are the four data sets. I have no idea why the United Kingdom was left out. Uh, so I did some research to fill that in, uh, which I'll show a little bit later. Uh, but it shows that in terms of the volume of thinking and publication in deep learning, some of, the, some of the newer material, but China's now taken the, the, the world lead uh, starting in 2015. Uh, in terms of startup funding, uh, we see that China exceeds the United States in equity funding shares for new startups, 
but I think that is masked by existing very large companies like the big three in the United States, which probably have a much larger volume uh, than some Chinese funding in terms of capitalization and resources. So, but just in terms of startups where a lot of new ideas and a lot of innovation are, uh, the Chinese are putting some money behind that three times greater than the rest of the world uh, in terms of startups. So Mr. Schmidt's conclusion that by 2020 he thinks the Chinese will have caught up and by 2030 they will dominate the business industries is a pretty aggressive pers pers perspective and one that I don't share yet. Uh, but given Mr. Schmidt's understanding of the science, maybe we should give him a little more credibility than me because I can barely handle my cell phone. Uh, here's my research to support uh, from a, for a UK audience. You should be happy to know uh, that the UK dominates AI startups in Europe. Uh, that you exceed all the rest of the European countries combined, uh, which is, I think, good news for the UK. Uh, the UK is a leading source of uh, thinking in artificial intelligence. Israel's up there as a sample. Uh, I guess for an, an Israeli perspective, that's a very high uh, total given the, both the per capita and the uh, budgetary size of Israel in comparison. But uh, I think that's a good sign for at least for the UK and Europe. This is another regional perspective share of world publications in artificial intelligence over a long period of time. And what I found interesting in this is that Europe has always had the majority of published research papers uh, in artificial intelligence going back to the 1990s and still holds a considerable lead uh, over everybody else to include the United States, which is not a very um, heavy publisher apparently in, in world publications. I don't know what accounts for that, uh, but in terms of volume, uh, Europe is still a major contributor in terms of research. And that's a very recent uh, document that just came out in uh, 2019. So good news for Europe from that perspective. Uh, this is an issue about the quality of research papers. So quantity is one thing. Uh, you know, <coughs> getting a paper published in a fourth tier publication you know, is one thing. Uh, it's important probably to think about the quality of research. So the left graph shows top 10% papers, the right graph shows the top 1% of papers based in terms of number of citations and somebody's estimate of the quality of the papers. And it shows the convergence between Chinese and American outlets in terms of top AI papers. In both cases, uh, we see a very distinctive trend. Uh, US quality or percentage of that is dropping and Chinese uh, quality is increasing. So the qualitative gap uh, is closing as much as uh, the already excessive quantitative gap. This is university rankings, another metric I'm looking at. Uh, good news for uh, British, uh, Oxford was number 12 and now it's up to number six, big increase just in a short period of time. Bad news for the Canadians, bad news for the Israelis, their four schools have dropped out. And the other news is you know, China's entered the game in a much bigger way than anybody else and now has four of the top uh, universities which is still measuring published papers and the quality of those papers. The data I'd like to have, which I'm now collecting, uh, deals with patents and the quality of patents. And I have access to that material, but the author uh, prefers to get the pu paper published first, uh, so I'm not, not authorized to cite his work. Uh, but the suggestion is, is that uh, China has flooded the market in terms of the number of patents, but the quality is very low. They're very thin, they don't say much, they're not widely cited, um, but they're perhaps in terms of mass uh, significant. They're, they're trying to innovate uh, and they're trying to publish and claim patents. Uh, but that, that would be another metric of way of looking at it. This is an interesting assessment put together by Kaifu Li. Uh, anybody familiar with the book? Yeah, one person. So uh, this is a Taiwanese American, uh, worked for Google for 25 years. Five years of that he ran Google Beijing. So his understanding of the American market and the Chinese market, I think, would be highly credible. Um, and he wrote this book. He believes that China will surpass the United States in terms of its business and perhaps security capabilities in AI, and is going to do so by 2025. I believe he's wrong. I believe his uh, structural assessment's incorrect. But he believes that the technology exists today globally, and it's now in the implementation business, and that China has a lot of second-tier systems engineers and computer scientists that can implement science that's already been developed. And he believes that China's view of big data, its view of state-owned uh, data, the ability of the state to extract that data from companies, uh, and the e-commerce facility that uh, Chinese have 
It's just going to generate more data that they can use, can make better usage of. So because of those aspects, because of how they view privacy or the lack thereof, how they view the government's role of data and information, that they will accelerate very quickly from where they stand today. But third row from the bottom there, from the top, the perception AI is based on the surveillance technology, and he believes they're already ahead of us in that, and they will have a massive lead, again, because of the state's understanding of surveillance and the state's need to control the population. The autonomous AI, they believe that the United States has a significant advantage, you know, nine to one, which, which I don't think is true. Uh, but he thinks they're going to be 50-50 and equal, have be comparable and equal to the United States in a short period of time. Uh, and that's a big stretch to say from 2017 when the book was written to that level. Um, that's a big significance. So other people are looking at this. They're coming up with some kind of structural analysis, and they have some concerning um, assessments to make. Talk a little bit about military revolutions, hopefully get the military folks uh, interested. Um, this is Dr. Payne's book. Dr. Payne's up at Shrivingham at uh, DCDC. Really like this book. Um, he has made some very strong conclusions of things that I, that I consider to be question marks. Uh, but he's come up with his, his conclusions. He believes that AI will be very effective at the strategic level in terms of giving commanders oracles or assisted decision support systems that will improve the quality of strategic decision making. That's the civilian and the military aspects. His more important conclusion is, and this is what I believe is true, uh, that AI does produce a military revolution because militaries that can successfully use this capability will have a significant or dramatic increase in their fighting power relative to somebody who cannot almost in every single domain of military operations. And he believes that soon, which I've challenged a little bit, autonomous platforms will be able to maneuver faster and employ force with more precision than those operated by humans. And in my interaction, thinking about trying to challenge that uh, assessment, I had to realize that in, in some of our systems today, whether it's Aegis or Patriot, we do have machines that operate faster with more precision today in defensive systems and are capable of outthinking and outacting faster than the human. So what I thought was a, a challengeable assertion about soon is, is just take it out. It already exists. Uh, but if you believe it's in the offense, which is what he told me uh, on Monday, uh, I'll accept his conclusion. Uh, it's probably going to be sooner rather than later. I like the notion of military revolutions. My good friend Dr. Murray in the United States has studied military revolutions. Um, he finds them to be often unpredictable and unforeseeable. Uh, that's because most people are not being healthy skeptics. They're just being unhealthy skeptics and not looking at these things. So I like that point. I, this is why I think studying this or exploring this in a non-complacent way is really important. Dr. Murray believes that revolutions recast societies and the state as well as military organizations. They alter the capability of states to create and project military power. I would add to that they also alter the ability of states and organizations to generate economic and military power. And artificial intelligence is both of that. But the most important point I like, and I've highlighted in bold here, the word revolution scares a lot of military people. They think that everything from the past is being thrown away. All military revolutions build up upon the previous revolution. And I think that's very true uh, for this coming revolution. We proceeded from through these revolutions. We've had the modern combined arms in the 21st century. We had the nuclear revolution, which didn't change the conventional force very much. And we've lived through the information revolution now. Our connectivity, our speed, our precision, our ability to act, understand to some degree with some limitations, but our ability to project and see things and then to hit things has obviously been, been more and more precise. Uh, this next revolution, autonomous weapons, swarms, will all build upon that. It will still be an airplane. It will still be an armored vehicle. It will still be maneuver and precision attack. It may be faster. It may have different components of manned and unmanned in those systems. Uh, and the revolution will just be in the dramatic efficiency and effectiveness of that force relative to somebody that doesn't have that capability uh, through these other sciences. That's the revolution that I think Dr. Payne and I agree on is the future. And the reason we want to pursue that is just there's so many military applications that artificial intelligence brings about. I, I can't think of almost any aspect of military operations to include the personnel system that seems to be impervious to change. Uh, 
our logistics, our mobility planning, our intelligence synthesis, ground maneuver, undersea maneuver, air maneuver that cannot be touched um, by artificial intelligence and autonomy. I can conceive of a vignette of the need in a military contingency in the Baltic Sea in which our ability to reinforce allies in the Baltic Sea is blocked by Kaliningrad. I can envision a scenario in which unmanned aircraft and autonomous aircraft uh, attack the air defense system in that area that's preventing NATO from reinforcing its friends in the Baltics. And I can see the machines being effective, uh, reducing risk, increasing speed, and being effective against an integrated air defense system of the highest caliber possible. I can see 100 machines coming in, maybe 60 machines coming back out and landing that day, and all those machines are smarter than the 100 machines that started because they now all understand the air defense system, the integrated air defense system they just attacked. And that information is instantly shared horizontally among those 60 machines. And when they land, there's another 40 machines for the second wave to augment the planes going back in. And all those 40 machines know what the 60 machines did the day before. They know the frequencies. They know the gaps in the air defense systems. They know the direction of the missiles. Uh, they're just as smart as the people that fought yesterday, which is not what we would have done with man pilots unless we briefed them very, very carefully and they put it all between their heads. Uh, I can see that being a very effective capability. I can see that being a very nice deterrent um, against a clear potential problem for NATO. But is it really revolutionary? Uh, again, these are my questions. I'm, I'm not as sure. Uh, it's not revolutionary in the sense it's going to happen soon. It's going to be very evolutionary. Uh, we should recognize that implementation with some algorithms and some capabilities started two decades ago. Um, and, but this machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, uh, the, new, the new chips uh, are going to accelerate this that we need to be ready for. Again, a lot of applications are only going to enhance what we already do. I may introduce more unmanned systems to that, but it's still going to be combined arms the way we understand it today. A lot of these applications will not displace a human being. There's three levels for all technology. Uh, when we get new technology, we get an assistant like Alexa, and then we get a partner, like in our car. Uh, only, only when capabilities are very well developed do we get to the point in time where a machine replaces a human being. Uh, an analogy I like to use is the British cavalry officer who saw the first airplane uh, in, for, in World War I. And what did, what did the cavalry officer think? Do you think he was going to be replaced? Do you think that an uh, airplane was going to displace the value of cavalry in collecting reconnaissance? No, he thought it would be a great, a great assistance to the horse because the, the fodder would be brought forward faster and the horse would be fed easier. Uh, again, we, we think about our own paradigm and we think about how this technology assists or augments what we already do uh, rather than the fact that within a year or two we understood that the intelligence and the surveillance that the airplane was bringing was faster, more accurate, could capture more information back for the allied commanders. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have to learn how to go through that same kind of process over time. I think the progress is going to be very uneven in certain domains. There's areas where there's a lot of payoff. Uh, I don't know exactly what the prioritization are. That's one of my research questions. Where should you put your first you know, million pounds? Where should you put the last million pounds in that? I don't believe that we're going to have a new paradigm uh, for some period of time. There's no change in warfare that this would be. It's just going to be the significant increase in capability. So. There's conversation about hyperwar. There's certainly in one or two domains in cyber and missile defense, a combination of hypervelocity missiles attacking um, uh, perhaps our states in which decision making is going to be so compressed and so impossible for a human being to make in the timelines required that we're going to have to automate and make autonomous some defensive systems. Uh, that might be the place to, to put that because of the time aspects. I don't see a new arm. Uh, it's not like space. Uh, if for those who need a space force or a cyber service, I don't see an AI service. I don't see a new branch. For some people, that's their definition of a change in warfare. Uh, when you displace, uh, dismiss, you know, horse cavalry, uh, you've created a revolution. I don't see that kind of revolution uh, coming up. But there is one aspect that people will find revolutionary is when you change competencies uh, or you change some skill sets. And it's entirely possible that artificial intelligence will change some competencies and skill sets. This also comes from Lee's book. I'm sorry if I did not properly cite his, uh, his work, but this is from Lee's book. 
Uh, this is its assessment of job skills in a two by two matrix uh, by whether or not they have a social requirement to interact with people from social to asocial and whether the context requires creativity and originality from the far right over the far left. So if you're up in the upper left, uh, you're a financial planner, a teacher, a doctor, and you need to interact with human beings. So there's a high social context, but the jobs are op uh, more optimized and routinized uh, than most. I think college professors, are there any college professors in the room? One. I'm sorry, sir, we're, I, think, I, think, I think we're becoming part of the human veneer. You know? uh, we'll have hundreds of students and we'll use artificial intelligence to interact with them, but, uh, but you don't wanna be in the danger zone. You don't wanna be in a job that does not require great specificity about changes in multiple forms of context, does not have a political and social context, and does not even require interaction with people. Uh, so this is the, you know, the bank teller that's become the ATM, uh, a couple other jobs. There may be some intelligence analysts who will be displaced who are no longer necessary. If you're in the intelligence business, I'm sorry. Um, I told uh, some of the crowd at DC, DC, because there's a lot of pilots in the room, that they might fall into the danger zone uh, over some period of time. Not happy about that. We'll find something else for them to do. They could all become commanders. What I, have not, what I have not done yet is put this into military occupational specialties because it would depress the people up at DCDC and I didn't want to do that to anybody. Uh, so I left that out. Uh, so there'll still be generals, I guess, as CEOs. For some reason, I don't know why barristers are important. Uh, I'm like Shakespeare, I killed them all, so I'm sorry, sir. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for those who like lawyers, um, but we do need to ask ourselves, you know, what are the human manpower, training, and education aspects of this. You know, what, what, what does change in how we teach people? And I have some ideas about selectivity. Some people uh, may not uh, be suited for this world. We'll have to see. But it would be nice to know now on what fields we have and what the manpower implications are and what the training implications are, uh, if we could come up with those. So th my question marks for where I'm trying to get to with my research right now. I uh, was exploring both Dr. Murray's book and this book from Iran, Professor Hunley, Dick Hunley's uh, work, Things to Think About Revolutions. If you suspect there's a potential for a revolution, there's a few things that you should accept. They're rarely brought about by the dominant power, usually more of a revisionist or an up-and-coming power. So the United States, which may have a lot of funding and may be producing a lot of quality papers, uh, may not be able to bring about a, a significant change like this. But revolutions do bring about enormous changes, at least in the near term, most of the time. I often use uh, Blitzkrieg as the source of a military example for someone who gets an initial uh, advantage, then, then if the war is long enough, you can recover from. Again, if the war is long enough, you can recover from that. If it takes you 18 months to learn how to do submarine warfare in the Pacific, or in the American case, at least two years to learn how to do combined arms at the divisional level, and if the war lasts long enough, you might survive, but only if the war is long enough. Technical RMAs are a product of combinations of technologies, and the autonomy revolution, deep learning, neural nets, chips, quantum computing, robotics, material sciences, uh, there's definitely a cluster of four or five technologies that are emerging to create this capability, so it qualifies. Long time to come to fruition, 10 or 20 years. Arguably, if we're in the, we could be in the 10th or 20th year of this particular revolution already and not even realize it. The most important point for my military friends, particularly here and back in Washington, is we often fight, ignore, uh, or resist uh, new things uh, until the first battle, and then it's self-evident, and then we kind of move on. Uh, if you can survive to live long enough to get to the second battle, that's not a problem. Uh, but if there isn't a second battle and you've lost, it uh, doesn't give you very much. I'm trying to formulate, these are not implications as much as my research questions for the next year, if uh, the Pentagon would give me uh, some free time to explore some things. You know, what is it about first mover advantage that artificial intelligence is offering? Both in an economic sense, we know that the early introducing companies in several areas of the major tech get enormous advantage of big scale on the business world. You know, is that true on the, on the military side? And is the first mover advantage is it better to be in the second place and learn from someone else's mistakes, like what, what we might learn from Russia's mistakes, and just be the second mover and learn from that and not have to expend as much experimentation or investment in different things? Uh, but most people believe that artificial intelligence does give a very potent first mover advantage, and we cannot afford to be too far behind. Speed of command and control, this, this issue of hyperwar. General Allen is now the president of the Brookings Institution, if I can mention a, another institution in this house. Uh, it's far enough away. 
Um, it's possible. Uh, there, I think there's some, definitely some domain-specific applications where speed is more paramount than anything else that could, that could constitute hyperwar. I just don't want to generalize that there's many forms of warfare in which I don't think split second or millisecond speed is necessary. We do not enable platoon commanders in urban environments to have to have certain missile launch capabilities, not necessary. The more interesting thing for those of us who work in the crossroad between civil and military decision making, uh, the pressures and frictions that artificial intelligence might raise. I can envision a president coming from the business world, uh, maybe after having bankrupted several casinos, uh, <laughs> coming, coming into office, uh, and deciding that the decision support system that he used so successfully in his commercial application might be of use for him in his decision making process in the White House. And he might decline the professional advice of a military advisor uh, because he's more comfortable with, has a lot of time with, and great exposure and confidence in his system. That could create some friction. Uh, whose algorithm do you trust? What do you believe in? Uh, could raise an issue. But the more probable friction is going to be the issue of time. Uh, when the Pentagon says, hey, you have to assign rules of engagement to all these ships in the Gulf, they've got to be able to take out a ship or an airplane on too fast a timeline because the missiles are too fast and you may create escalation things and that's a risk you have to take if you want those ships to survive in the Gulf. And a president or a civilian might be very reluctant to delegate to some commander or some one-star officer 6,000 miles away the delegation and authority to defend himself that might lead to an escalation of war. And that's going to cause some civil military friction if people don't understand the timeline. The same thing for the computer defense of the United States, the defense of the city, uh, or a missile attack uh, that some uh, nation in Northwest Asia you know, might launch against the United States. There's not going to be a lot of time in some situations. And it's going to create some civilian pressure to understand that some of those things have to be delegated. And they're going to be very uncomfortable with that. Uh, that's, that's a real implication. The other side is AI may induce risk taking by civilian masters who think that war becomes risk free because there's no humans in the machines. Uh, seen a little example of that maybe this week in which you know, human and machines not considered to be escalatory. Uh, so maybe it goes both ways, uh, but something we need to work out. Uh, does making war unmanned increase the propensity for some states to attack because they think there's less risk uh, involved in a counterattack? needs to be wrestled with. I'm utterly lost on priorities for investment, offense versus defense, command and control first. <coughs> right now we're spending a lot of time on medical and logistics. There's a lot of payoff there for human lives and for our logistics costs, saving some money, perhaps even paying for itself. Uh, we're doing less in the C2, cyber, and maybe some other areas than we should be. And I, I'm always interested in both the uh, ethics issue and the impact of organizational culture. Uh, are we slowing innovation because institutions are unsure of the capabilities, or are certain communities like pilots uh, think that they're so superior in all situations that we should not explore uh, unmanned aerial vehicles with autonomy, uh, which my Navy friends tell me is not true, but I don't see the investment levels in our Navy that might suggest that we are going as fast as we should. So my conclusions, wrapping up, hope everybody saw that movie, another dystopic uh, movie, but a lot of man-machine man interface, some augmented intelligence, some brain-computer interface. Unfortunately, also a world of haves and have-nots, uh, maybe to think about on the social implications of some of these technologies. I've got uh, four points. First, just accept that limited autonomy is already here. It's already been exploited by both friends and potential adversaries in the task-specific world. I think that we're very rapidly going to get up to this augmented intelligence level where man and machine are interfacing together quite frequently in cars and airplanes and at sea. I uh, doubt that we're going to go quite as far into the autonomous world as we could, um, but we'll see. I don't think China shares those inhibitions, uh, so we have to think about that. Uh, I believe China will have the comparable capabilities that will not surpass the West. They will not, with a centralized economy, a centralized command system. They will not take the risk or incentivize the reward systems to pass us uh, unless they borrow it, adapt it, uh, acquire the technology in an uh, insidious way. Uh, I don't believe that they'll pass us, but it's possible. I do believe that ethics needs a debate. I believe the debate needs to be balanced and understanding that our adversaries may not be as uh, prudent 
or as concerned about the same things we are. Uh, and we should also understand the morality of putting people in harm's way in very dark and dirty places. There's a moral uh, effect to that decision too. Uh, when you have the opportunity to do things better, faster, cheaper, and safer for our own people, that might be a consideration to balance off some of the other debate. And that part of the debate's not been raised. And I look for questions from that during Q&A. And then finally, the thing that bothers me the most in the Pentagon, uh, again, the healthy skepticism, critical thinking, true experiments, machine against machine, man against machine, to find out what this revolution can and cannot deliver. Uh, some people are concerned about that, that we're going to drive the humanity out of war, and that war will not be, you know, as Clausewitz said, a, a clash of human wills. I disagree. Uh, at ultimately, at some level, the decision to go to war, who to go to war against, and how to go to war is going to be made by a civilian policy official and a military professional. So I'm not as concerned about that. And with that, I will take questions. Great. Do, do you want to stay yeah. up or no, no, I'll sit down? I'll sit down, yeah. Hopefully, they didn't run you too might. long. Um, I've got one question for you. What was the film? Which film? The one you showed at the end. Oh, Elysium. Yeah. Okay. Um, jo Jodie Foster with a bad accent. Um, well, thanks very much, Frank. That was really useful. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that technology does have revolutionary social, political, and economic effects. And if you want a recent example of this in which no AI was involved, it's the way that um, smartphones and social media were used by Extinction Rebellion for their London pro protests, which comprehensively defeated the Metropolitan Police, the largest police force in the, in the, in the UK. Um, so that's a powerful sort of warning. Um, I'm going to extend the question period by about 10 minutes to get as many people in as I can. Uh, the rules of engagement are, if you catch my eye, I'll direct a microphone to you. Could you please say who you are and what organisation you come from, and also um, keep your point as brief as you can so we can get as many people in as possible. And we'll go to the front row first to um, Eleanor Beaver from the IISS. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Um, and I like that your presentation has brought out nicely that autonomy isn't a binary and there's a lot more potential, I think, for human-in-the-loop robotic systems and a more kind of interaction-style role. But I've, you seem to have painted quite a kind of mixed picture of attitudes within the defense community around the notion of autonomy. Uh, so on the one hand, there's uh, an anxiety to keep pace with China that has explicitly said it wants to achieve completely autonomous systems. And then on the other hand, there's a reluctance to get too revolutionary and to um, exclude human roles from those systems. Uh, so you've touched on this already, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your experience within the defense world and where you see those priorities ultimately um, ultimately falling down? This one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, and it, this happens with all revolutions. You know, the pragmatic military uh, responsible for in the near and midterm maybe going to war is not inclined to take risky maneuvers and when we're somewhat underfunded uh, because we've been doing other things the last 15 years, a very scarce capital time to invest in, in the future. Uh, so I see the tension between uh, military personnel and then at the other level is the defense side. Mr. Work, um, some of the science community, the acquisition community, much more comfortable thinking about the long term, much more comfortable about exploring significant increases in capability uh, and seeing also the pressure between the scale of the problem set in Asia and the scale of the resources that might be available, particularly in the mid to longer range. Uh, people are looking for, in Mr. Work's term, the offset strategy kind of thing. They're, they're looking for something to regain something they believe is eroded. So the services just have a narrower, closer timeline. And they're much more pragmatic. And that's military innovation. I spent the first 20 years of my life uh, down in the Marines in combat development thinking about you know, more of the near term. Uh, I see the defense officials more interested in technology and driving change from the top down. And that's the, the clash that I, that I sense. Um, and again, most of the military is not have the same technical literacy as the senior managers do. Thanks, Frank. We'll go along the front row to John Dowdy in the front. And uh, John Doughty, head of the 
Defense and Security for McKinsey. Um, Dr. Hoffman, I wanted to uh, pick up the, your final point, uh, which I think is a fascinating one, which is uh, your, one of your conclusions is that we'll always have the big decisions made by uh, a civilian leader and a military professional. And um, uh, one phrase I, I didn't hear you say at all in your presentation is human in the loop, uh, which of course gets a lot of play in this whole area. Um, many people see it as a panacea to fix all problems with AI and autonomy. Um, I think it may be a bit of a fig leaf instead, but that's my view and I'm interested in yours. Um, uh, but you provided also another glimpse of something which is in direct contrast to your statement at the end, which is that hyperwar is possible in some domains, in, in uh, space, uh, in cyber, and for strategic uh, programs. And I wonder if you wanted to comment about speed and um, how that applies differentially to different domains and what it might mean for ultimate human control. Great question. It is, it is, it's one challenge. We were playing with the, uh, we had a big uh, presentation at uh, Washington on in the loop, on the loop. It's, it is a fig leaf in the sense that uh, we know that humans fail in their overwatch by being on the loop because they're bored by a routine operation that occurs for 20 days in a row and nothing happens. And the ability to push the button to stop it uh, is, is difficult. The human factors in you know, being on the loop. Uh, so the, I've been, been thinking of an you know, alternative thing that basically my human aspect there is that the human is, creation at, is creating the loop and that's the human element. You know, you've designed the algorithm, you've, a human has built the risk and reward portion of it, and that's where the human factor comes in. The human aspect is in creating the machine and feeling the machine and putting the rule set into the machine. Uh, you know, the algorithm has a risk and reward factor to it, about, and it has rules of engagement about what not to do and what to do, and that's perhaps where we have to live with, at least at the hyperspeed, at, the, at the, those tactical situations in which rules of engagement have to be preloaded due to the, the issue of time and impact this might have in crisis stability between major states is getting some profound thinking, most of it at the strategic systems capability. But General Cartwright's been talking about this for well over a decade when he was STRATCOM, that we're talking about things in milliseconds. The notion that the president can be called, brought out of a room, hand a slip of paper, turn to the chief, say I need to talk to the national security advisor, I need to have the chairman, I need to have a meeting, make a decision. You know, meanwhile, you know, 15 missiles have hit someplace or a city's burned down or the financial district was wiped out and everything's gone. Um, that, 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 that's the time pressure I think we have. So uh, we may have uh, other forms of um, integration that we're not thinking about what in the loop and on the loop means uh, in the future. Uh, but I, I do agree, it's somewhat of a fig leaf. It gets us to an ethical thing. There's a human that's supervising this, even if he or she's ultimately inca incapable of making decisions or acting fast enough. It makes us feel better that there's somebody there that can understand political, social context uh, and then it's also accountable. Uh, accountability is an issue that I didn't raise in my presentation either. Uh, and that's the hard part for the politician. He's still going to be accountable even if he's delegated it to a, uh, a field commander, a naval task force commander in the Persian Gulf. Um, just to add to that, for those of you who are particularly interested, about a year ago I posted an article on the ISS blog about the problem of military assurance and how you assure artificial intelligence systems where code is learning by rewriting itself. It's called, is assurance the Achilles heel of military AI systems? Um, take a question from the front, from yeah. Paul, Sh Paul Schultz. But shouldn't we be scared, or, or very scared, uh, in a more general way than, than even you have suggested? Um, and, the, and the fact that we should be scared without exit from fear is going to affect democratic politics. You've said that AI is too powerful not to develop. Um, it seems to be impossible to monitor other people's progress or, or, or ban or control. Um, and that uh, automated C3I and battle management systems are going to generate and interpret strategies and moves in radically new ways. Um, so they're going to interact with each other and this will happen, as you said, very fast, probably presumably in self-exciting ways in which you 
if there are humans in, in the loop and they get to press the buttons, it will be as a result of judgments coming out from those um, unpredicted interactions. Uh, that's a predicament which is more worrying, and not just in the nuclear field, but especially in the nuclear field, than, than has generally been acknowledged, uh, e even with those people who are professionally scared by this. How do, how do we acknowledge it and how do we deal with the political responses? I'm, I'm not in the political business. Right, which was, which was, again, the awareness and the transparency of what you, why, why we need to do and what we need to do. And we still not, have not convinced our uh, legislatures of what we need to do. We haven't even convinced the military uh, at the pace that the strategy suggests is necessary. Uh, I like your point. The, the issue of arms control came up at uh, the school the other day. Uh, some people would like to negate the risk and, and have a international norm. We spent, we spent four or five years in New York the last couple of years, and we have not yet got the Russians, the United States, to agree on the definition of lethal and autonomous, much less laws. And we don't agree on the law yet, um, so we struggle with that. One of the issues that I've been playing with, you know, the better and faster ways uh, and keeping both accountability and humans is to think of the in the loop in a different way than we currently connote it. Uh, everyone's familiar with Daniel Kahneman's concept of system one and system two thinking the, we have the in, intu intuitive side of our brain where we just see a situation, immediately recognize it, do the right thing. Uh, that scares some people. And then there's the deliberative side of our brains and our staffs. We have con very intensive staffs to think about uh, problems, contingencies, plans. I think the machines will displace a lot of better ways, more creative ways, also be able to test those ways. I've been thinking of a concept, and DARPA is working on this to some degree, system three thinking, uh, where the man's literally in the loop. Um, might be sitting in Washington, might be sitting in the field, but you're actually connected to the system in some way that the Elysium movie signifies to some degree. And it's the human who's directing the machine, it's not taking advice, it's searching a library, it's evaluating COAs, uh, it's the human brain that's interacting the case studies, the risk and reward systems, and is actually red teaming and wargaming his own options. Uh, the, the, you're literally connected to the net and to the information. Uh, you're literally connected to the computer uh, in the matrix or Elysium you know, kind of concept. That brain-computer interface to make people that can't speak speak, to move uh, human limbs. We're working at that level in neuroscience these days. That might be a way of injecting humanness uh, into the system and literally being inside the loop. The question for me is, is system three thinking and system three interface something that you train and educate for or is it something you select for? Uh, there are people in this room who, and I am one of them, have been tested to be a pilot. Uh, I can show you the reason why I'm a retired infantryman is because I cannot fly an airplane. I lack the spatial capability of flying an aircraft. Uh, it's possible in system three thinking, uh, we need to know who uh, can operate in that world, uh, in a virtual world, in the loop, uh, not just merely on top of or at the loop, which is what the way we, we currently have for, for fig leaves. Uh, Uh, hopefully we have selected commanders, and hopefully it's a military professional, you know, uh, if it's a military problem. Um, but yes, it's, that's a larger thing to think of. But also, like, the, the question on arms control is a fascinating thing. We're not going to make any progress. And as long as you cannot verify and you have no trust, and I have no trust of the Russians whatsoever, I uh, can't find an agreement that they have lived up to in the last 10 years. Uh, the Chinese might have some, but th th there's no visibility, there's no transparency, and there's no accountability. And if the step change and increase in capability is, and you end up in a war with somebody, uh, you just set yourself up for a, for a major operational loss and perhaps a strategic loss. I'd also add that everything that, the problem that you posed, Paul, and everything that Frank said, reinforces the need to, to not only to experiment with these systems, but to actually train with them, including high-level exercises will involve not only the senior military, but other senior officials from other government departments and the equivalent of government ministers. Now, time marches on. I've got at least five questions. Frank, if you're happy, I'll ask that they be brigaded and Hello. come at you in a, in a, in a, a swarm. volley. A swarm. So we'll, we'll, we'll start um, with the lady at the back of the right. 
Um, hi, I'm Sophie McCormack from BASIC. Um, so I was really interested in what you said about AI being evolutionary rather than revolutionary. But if the technology is here today, is not the biggest thing underpinning the answer to how revolutionary AI is or will be, the political and legal constraints? And as you put it, is that not then where you should put your first 100,000? Exactly, and I'd observe that legal constraints were part of, would appear to be part of the problem with the Met's response to Extinction Rebellion. Um, gentleman on the aisle in the white shirt. Yes, hi. Uh, sorry, this is another political question, but um, so we're here in this room right now very intrigued by you know the evolution of AI, but thinking about the uh, political constraints back in the United States, like the middle class voter, they're already seeing in the business sector AI r displacing people in the millions, the truck drivers, the retail workers, you know. It's a very sellable message to tell, you know, the middle class voter that this, this AI that's already taking your jobs, it's displacing your families, is now going to be used, um, developed by the military, the defense community, to um, ha have the potential to kill people basically without the, uh, in other countries, without the American citizen even knowing, you know. Having really dis destructive capabilities, like you said, the risk of preemptive war. So. What do you think is the likelihood that Washington uh, will sort of try to halt this uh, AI development? And obviously that would sort of put ourselves back against China, which is really increasing its capabilities. And what is the defense community, wh how would the def defense community deal with that if you think it's a risk? Okay, and for the third question, we'll have Antonio Sampaio at the front. Thank you. My question uh, relates to another potential friction, um, which is between the more human political side of armed conflict and the more, if I may, militaristic or technical side of interstate conflict. Um, so what I mean by that is, is, is that in, for the pa since 9-11, we've been talking a lot and since Afghanistan and Iraq, talking about counterinsurgency and the human side of war, uh, relations with local communities, etc. And it seems to me that a lot of when, when Putin is saying that whoever controls AI will, you know, be the dominant power in the world, he's talking about uh, state level interstate wars. And what we see in the trends in armed conflict today is that um, in internal wars, civil wars, non state armed groups are the, the prevailing form of conflict. Whereas the interstate, you know, interstate wars have been in decline for for a long time. So, how would AI play out in the more human-intensive side of of conflict, war among the people? Uh, you've mentioned urban environments. I'm thinking here that if AI really uh, lowers the bar for the deployment of armed force, then urban environments would be a perfect uh, battlefield for that because um, it's an environment that has been traditionally hostile, very very um, intensive in, in human deaths, combatants' deaths. So AI would lower the threshold for, for deployment. So how would AI play out with these more human social dynamics of conflict? Love that question. Okay, far back. Three back. Um, so on the evolutionary aspect, I, I, I don't think political and legal restraints are stopping us. It's entirely cultural, um, particularly in military culture, that's retarding uh, change. Uh, the degree of change, the degree of experimentation uh, is, is, is the barrier that I sense, um, particularly in the services, uh, which is why the commission and why the joint office had to be stood up and why the strategy had to be so explicit uh, because the pace of change we perceive from the external is not being matched on the internal uh, dimension. So I think it's military service culture uh, and nothing else that's the biggest inhibitor. And there's also some concerns on the ethics that we're not uh, currently uh, working through that problem enough. Again, I, the other, other issue I think we're having that's retarding progress is we've had some elements inside the big uh, tech companies that don't want to work with the Pentagon. And that's probably the second order effect that's going to decrease the velocity of change and the velocity of interface, since most of the innovation is in the public sector, in the private sector, in those big corporations. The top tier thinking, uh, the large scale capabilities of the big tech companies. It's not in small garages yet, it's, it's not available inside uh, the federal system, it's all on the outside. And that's slowing up some of the interface right now over the last few years. Uh, on the political, economic, 
and socioeconomic dimensions. I think if you were trying to sell this to the American people, since they're less interested in overseas issues, they're more interested in their economic prosperity and their defense of uh, the homeland issues, uh, the fact that you can engage overseas at less personal cost to their sons and daughters is probably a selling point. Also, the fact that if you're overhead and logistics, medical, command and control, all the back office kind of capabilities that AI claims to offer and is now offering in some of our business uh, organizations, it reduces the size of the military. And countering the argument I've made about the ethics, uh, people who do not want to employ these capabilities in any aspect, which includes the 3,000 people from Google uh, that signed the petition, uh, they are arguing to me for a larger Pentagon, a larger defense budget, which is already gargantuan. Uh, I don't believe we should be spending that amount of money. I don't believe we can sustain that kind of a defense budget uh, without looking for more effective and more efficient systems. So I think it's actually easier to sell artificial intelligence to the domestic element by reducing the cost of the military and increasing its effectiveness. Um, human political uh, of course, you're correct on the, you know, interstate warfare has always been rare. I don't think it's declining per se, it's just always there. It's a small N, uh, Tassim's, uh, you know, point there. Uh, however, non-state actors in civil conflict have always been the most frequent form of inner conflict and could continue. I did take a question on Monday the other day that I, I focus obviously on state level kind of things. And so are non-state actors gonna be able to employ some kind of an unmanned system? And the answer is we've already seen non-state actors and terrorists use unmanned systems. Uh, they're just not autonomous and they're lethal. Uh, they've been limited and they've been perhaps tactically effective, but they're not operationally strategically effective. Uh, my interest in this particular topic is we also need to think about the scale. We've been conditioned to think about drones and killing people in onesies and twosies. Uh, and that's not the scale of interstate war. Um, you know, we're, we are facing a period uh, in the next 20 years that's very unlike the statistics of the last 20 years. We did not face a period of great power competition. We had a unipolar era uh, with a unipolar and a unilateral state uh, defining and enforcing rules. We had a system that was agreed to for the last 50 years. Uh, that system is now contested. It's a multipolar world. There are alternative forms of government, alternative forms of economic systems now in play. Uh, those were the conditions that we faced in 1910. Those were the conditions we faced in the 1930s. Uh, also with the socioeconomic stress of new technologies, failing empires, and technological change, and mass inequality uh, in the economic system. All those exist today. So the Enlightenment and Pinker's argument uh, is correct statistically of the last 20 years, but historically it's very flawed. And I'm concerned that the period of great power competition brings back all the conditions we've seen in the past that show human history as ups and downs. And the downslide <coughs> that we've enjoyed for 20 to 50 years is, could potentially end. Um, but um, good, good question on that non-state actor. It's a, a flaw in that presentation. Thank uh, you. Okay, if you've got the, Frank, can you patience to take on two more questions? Yes. Um, okay, so I've got my two last questions. Could you both be as brief as you possibly can? At the back, Dr. Samir Puri from King's College. I've got a question about national culture and national difference. Um, the Kai Fu Lee book made a contrast between the US and Chinese appetites for technocracy domestically. But in terms of the military, how do you see the adoption of AI being shaped by different national cultures, Russia, China, US? Okay, and on the left-hand side of the aisle, gentleman in the brown shirt. Uh, Matthew Stavro, Cabinet Office, although uh, in a personal capacity. Um, how likely is it that rather than making war more discriminating, more precise, it will actually make it dirtier because uh, the delays of milliseconds or seconds taken to factor in things like international humanitarian law will be a delay too long and we'll discover that we will lose every single engagement unless we actually fundamentally change how we approach the ethics of war? Two very good questions to end with, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the latter, but let me start with the latter. I don't have as much of an argument based upon the readings I've read on international humanitarian law and how it affects the law of armed conflict if we have an interstate conflict. The necessity and proportionality issues, to me, uh, don't make that as much
much of an issue. Uh, is something specific? Okay, let's move on to Samia's question. Then. And I'm, I'm assuming conti contingencies that are maybe less vague and, and more clear. The uh, the other question on strategic culture. So I, this is an excellent question. Uh, you know, strategic culture is something I believe in. I took out a slide about uh, strategic culture because um, it's very pertinent to. If you're familiar with Dima Domsky's uh, book on uh, cultures of innovation, uh, different nations have to meet different cultures. Uh, and it will open and close certain lens uh, to what's feasible, to what's legal and ethical, uh, how they think about military problems and how they seek solutions. Uh, the American military culture is very conventional, very kinetic, very technologically agile, very logistically based, uh, almost apolitical and astrategic, blind in some sense. Uh, you know, so They'll, they'll push on the technology. The Russian philosophy of science, math, uh, music will, will influence how they think about it. Uh, Domsky's book is very interesting. It would suggest that they'll stay maybe more at the theory and less on the practical implementation side of things. Uh, I used to be a student of Russian culture, so I think it's very important to think, to think about that. I'm not a good student of Russian uh, or Chinese strategic culture. Uh, their, their desire to maintain control, their desire to focus more on their legitimacy and stability inside the state, uh, takes most of this AI and applies it to the domestic surveillance and economic you know, aspect, and less about the power projection and the military side of things. Uh, so I, I see less and less right now of concern uh, given what China thinks. As the century of humiliation comes to an end, and as they continue to become more powerful, have more of a power projection capability, I, I think we'll see a, a different form of their strategic culture uh, as they try to establish themselves uh, you know, from a regional power into, into something more. Uh, so they're already doing that economically, they're doing that politically, they do that in the information domain. They've not done it quite as much in the military sphere, but they are in the Indian Ocean. My last holiday research trip in the Baltic Sea. I saw my first Chinese frigate. Uh, it was in the Kiel Canal of all places during Baltic Ops as an obser uninvited observer, uh, sending a message that we're here, uh, we want to see what's going on. Uh, it was a beautiful ship. Um, uh, it was a brand new ship as well, and uh, looked very capable to me, uh, but I'm, I'm not a Chinese naval frigate expert. Uh, but that kind of a reach is there. So uh, I believe there are, uh, one of the issues of strategic innovation that we argue about right now, we're doing research at NDU on China as a emulator, uh, as an adopter, or as an innovator. And one of the changes we've seen over the last few decades is the more creative, more innovative capability, uneven in certain areas, uh, not doing well in semiconductors, but they seem to be doing well in some other areas, doing well in some ballistic missiles and space programs seem to be able to build uh, ships of a scale and size and a missile capability that they haven't had, say, 20 years ago. So more innovative, more creative, greater reach and greater technological capability. So a very powerful civilization with a wonderful history, uh, certainly capable of achieving anything they set their mind to uh, over time. Uh, and I would expect them to do so in, in this time period. Thank you. Well, Frank. Um, Thank you very much indeed. That's been a, a brilliant tour de horizon. Um, I'm particularly grateful that you've allowed it all to be on the, on the record. And it's certainly highlighted potential opportunities and, as you said, potentially dreadful cons consequences. Um, for what it's worth, I've been trying to educate myself on this over the last year. And if I may recommend two books and a film, um, Sorry, two, two books and a novel. 
Uh, the first book I'd recommend is um, Paul Shah's book, Army of None, uh, which, if nothing else, has a fantastic comparative case study of the US Navy's Aegis air defense and anti-missile system and the US Army Patriot, which really shows a complex interplay of human and cultural factors and training, which explains not only why the Aegis missile si system shot down the Iranian airliner, but also why there have been, there've been many more blue-on-blue -blue shoot, shoot downs by, by Patriot. Um, I'd also recommend the recently published book by um, Professor Marcus Dusotoy, The Creativity Code, which sets out to look at can, at can AI create in the arts. And that certainly opened my eyes and gave me the impression that provisionally it can. And finally, I'd recommend a recently published novel uh, by Ian McEwan, Machines and Me, which raises a whole load of interesting issues, is set in an alternate universe in which Alan Turing didn't commit suicide in the 1950s. Indeed, for those of you who are admirers of Turing, he has a walk-on part. But tell you any more, and I'd be accused of being a spoiler. Um, I'd just like to give you a heads up on forthcoming events at the Institute. On Friday, we've got a talk by Professor Natasha Lindstedt, Professor of Government and Deputy Dean of uh, Education and Social Sciences at the University of Essex. And she's talking about persistent rule, instability, conflict, and state failure. Um, and on Friday, the 28th of June, we've got um, Larry Diamond, senior fellow from the Hoover Institution, giving a talk uh, entitled Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition and American Complacency. And on the same day, but later, uh, Dr. Marco Zhao from the, direct, the director of the Africa Research Group will be giving a talk on peacekeeping in Africa, international norms and pragmatic approaches. Uh, but would you please join with me in thanking Frank for his excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.